Hello and welcome to Women of the Middle East podcast. Women of the Middle East. This podcast relates the realities of Arab women and their rich and diverse experiences. It aims to present the multiplicity of their voices and wishes to break overdue cultural stereotypes about women of the Middle East. My name is Amal Malki. I'm a feminist, scholar, and educator. This is Women of the Middle East podcast. Anam Dawar, lovely to have you on Women of the Middle East podcast. Thank you for having me, Dr. Amal. It's a pleasure. Now, let me begin by asking, who is the human and the woman behind the journalist? I call myself a dreamer. That's how I like to introduce myself. And since I was... I don't know, 10 years old, I knew that I wanted to to be a TV presenter and a journalist. And my dreams were my driving force because I was born and raised in the southern part of Lebanon and it was occupied by Israel. Since I was born, we were living in war. So my dreams were, were everything I have. And I think at some point... They shaped the journalist I am today or the woman I am today. I like to call myself a dreamer and thankfully I fulfilled my dreams. As a woman who has got into the media industry and you've worked in the media industry within different capacities, right? I love the fact that you were in the radio before going into TV as well. How do you see women being represented in Arab media for someone who was as young as you were when you entered the media industry. Did it embrace you or did you have to um, choose to either be a journalist or a woman? Wow, that's a very nice question, actually. I want to share a fun fact with you when I graduated in 2006 and they was looking I was looking for a job I got disappointed at some point because back then in 2000 if you look at the trends in the Lebanese media specifically in Lebanese media channel it stands for everything I don't represent the requirements to get a job were very hard for a girl like me because they were asking for some type of beauty standards. They don't care about your your brains, <laughs> the culture, the knowledge that you have. It was honestly about the looks. Uh, I couldn't find my place in 2006 and maybe... That's why I went to radio, because the requirements in radio are totally different. So it's just about your voice and your content. I found a job in a radio station, and I was lucky back then. But I always had this voice inside of me telling that you don't have to be disappointed. Because eventually, good journalists, either men or women, I'm not just talking about women here, good journalists who really have substance, they must find their way and they must prove themselves with time. I was really hopeful, despite everything deceptive around me. And I was lucky to find finally a job in a news channel and to prove myself as, as a knowledgeable TV presenter. It was a hard time for me. Always the beginnings are hard in every field, not only in our field or as TV presenter, but it was challenging for me because it wasn't the world that I was imagining when I was a kid. It was better in my imagination. When I was a child, it was a magical world for me, <laughs> being on TV and communicating with people and interviewing guests. It was like really like magic. But then you face the harsh reality <laughs> and it takes time to understand that it's not la vie en rose. You have to work hard. You have to overcome adversities. You have to be strong. And as a woman, it's challenging. It's much more challenging for us. You may think it's easy because in the media industry, we're women mostly. But no, it's challenging because you have to be strong and you have to stand for what you believe. I find it very hard for women in any field 
uh, our society imposes on our um, standards, unfortunately, either to suppress us or mm. uh, to use us for consumerism. And this is the problem with the, the media industry too. But I see you different. You have set the standards for yourself without yeah. following anyone's standard. I think if you want to stand up for what you believe, it takes time for you to establish your image. I'm 37 now. It wasn't easy. I started working when I was 19 years old. So I learned a lot. Building experience is not easy. And if you really don't want that easy fame, you have to work hard throughout the years. You have to believe in yourself. And maybe that's the key factor. If you see my success now, or if you see me like well established in my career, yeah. it's because I was consistent and I really believed in myself and I believed in my vision, Dr. Amal. It was, I have, I have a vision and I was, I was very determined to go for it. Then unfortunately we work harder than any man to establish ourselves in any field to get to a point where we are noticed, heard, respected, to be able to shape our own space. So people would start listening to us. While media should be the tool through which freedom of speech is practiced, through which social justice is defended and promoted, we know in reality that media is just a political tool that is subject to the, f the funders, basically, agendas. Did you get into media with your own personal agenda and set of values. Is there a place for women and women issues in our media? Do we have to really compromise? Is it about compromising to find your space or place? Listen, sometimes you have to compromise, but there are a set of beliefs that you cannot change or you cannot compromise. That's one thing, but you have to understand and to be clever in which area of compromising you can, you can play with it and in which other area you just have to be firm and just say no. You have to learn where to say no and how to say no. It was very hard to, for me and for many of my colleagues to be taken seriously. We understand politics. We understand how things are going, uh, the, the backstory of everything. We know what's going on. It's really hard to be taken seriously in, in this field. And as long as you're not compromising your beliefs, I can assure you that with time, if you can stand the test of time, you'll become so powerful in the future. You'll become so powerful with age because you will get to know how to deal with these challenges, especially with men or with people in power. It, I'm still a presenter and I do also on social media is creating content. That's my passion. But I wanted to be more free with expressing myself. And not only that, mm -hmm. I want to be free in influencing people in the right way that I see is good for them. I don't believe in politics anymore to change the world. I believe in the power of people. Individuals can change the world. So what I am doing now is giving me so much hope and energy. I'm, I'm happy with what I'm doing because I can control my content. I can control what I want to deliver to people. I'm a free spirit. I always search for freedom and I, freedom is really sacred for me. So I assessed my career and I found out that, yes, I can create my own identity with the power of social media. That's the compromise you do. This is why you said that 2021 was a, a monumental uh, year because yeah. you left the world of news, political programs, and decided to shift to human journalism. First of all, can you define what do you mean by human journalism? Actually, that's, a, that's an amazing question. Now I've been working for 20 years and I had the chance to work first in radio, as I told you, and then as a news presenter, as a 
TV host. I presented variety shows. I was an executive producer for my show as well. I'm presenting a show called Nothing is Impossible. And it's it's an inspirational, motivational show. And so I realized throughout the years that in every single part of this journey, you have to have your human touch. Journalism uh, without being in touch with people and voicing out their concerns, their fears, their hopes and dreams is not journalism. We are the voice of people. We are here to bridge the gap between the people in power and the people. So human journalism is journalism, actually, because we are here to talk about people who are watching us. And that's human journalism for me. So what I'm doing right now is being in, more in touch with people. I like to listen to their stories. I like to learn from them, to be inspired. We live our life to learn from each other. I'm a storyteller. So I travel in different countries and I meet people who really went through hard times, overcome really harsh realities and I want to learn from them how they made it and my mission now and how I see my career now is a tool to inspire people to live a better life especially in our tormented uh, region uh, Dr. Amal. I'm Lebanese but I'm also Syrian, I'm also Iraqi, I'm also Palestinian, Jordanian. I feel now that my mission is to give some hope and positive vibes to people. And I'm happy with what I'm doing right now because uh, as I change one human being perspective, that's enough for me. Following the Arab revolutions or the Arab Spring, the term citizen journalism has become very widely used. And it was mainly because people have been contributing to making the news as opposed to consuming the news. And yes. we've noticed back then that citizen journalism in the Arab world took a bilingual form, which was amazing because it meant that I can speak Arabic to my own people, but at the same time, I'm going to speak whatever it is, English or French, to the outside world because they need to hear what the people believe in. And this, I think, reflects mainly in our region, in the MENA region, our disappointment with our structures, whether it's the political structure or the media, even education. And this is why I think what you're doing is very important because you are redefining what influencing means. A P, uh, many papers have been written um, about um, the influencers. For example, in the GCC, influencers have become pivotal in promoting products, not values, products. So the, everything is really playing on our consumer uh, ability rather than our human feelings, our connection with other humans or with each other in the MENA region. And this is why um, I want to talk more about this shift. Again, it's a shift in the career rather than the change of the career. You're creating your own content and you're creating a content that is intelligent. And again, this is something that I'm going to underline. And this is what we need in the Arab world. We need intelligent content. Of course, there are different types of content, but if you're producing content and you have followers and people are watching you, that somehow you are intelligent in some ways, even if you are selling products. As a journalist, I believe in the power of social media. And I was on social media since 2012, I guess. I was on Instagram. I was posting my photos like everyone and segments from my shows and everything. But when I decided to create content, it was challenging for me because Honestly, Dr. Amal, I couldn't see myself on social media. I, I couldn't identify with any of the influencers on social media. For example, okay, I like clothes and beauty products and how to take care of my hair and uh, how to cook. And these are not the only interests that I have. I couldn't find like an influencer who 
talks about books, for example, this is what I do, or talks about culture, or these type of contents, uh, these type of influencers we miss in the Arab world. I was afraid I wouldn't find my audience or <laughs> there's no audience, but surprisingly, uh, people were craving for this type of content. People will follow you and will listen to what you are saying if you treat them with, with respect and authenticity. That's the main key mm. to produce relatable content to everyone. And the proof is that now I reached the 1 million followers. And it's not about numbers, believe me. It's about 1 million followers for an account with mostly books and mental health videos, motivational posts. That's something. So I always say to journalists or young content creators, just go for what you want. If you like uh, sports, if you like to talk about politics, if you like to talk about art, just do it. Don't think that you won't find your audience. Your audience will find you eventually. And I'm happy. I'm happy with, with the progress I'm making on social media because it's inspiring lots of other content creators to do the same. And I'm happy with creating this community of people who, uh, who really were waiting for someone to speak their language. And this is where I want to emphasize your content yeah. is authentic, intelligent, and it's in Arabic. And we know how uh, scarce is the content in Arabic, the yeah. internet. So to have a 1 million followers uh, to listen to your content in Arabic. This false ideas about Arabs, that we, we are interested in laughing and cooking, and entertainment. No, this is not true. We are a very large community of educated people. We are readers also. If you give people the right content to consume, they will consume it. They will, they will accept it. They will welcome it. You just have to give it to them with love. You don't have to care about numbers at first. When you produce this type of content, you don't, you don't have to expect to make millions <laughs> out of it. Mm -hmm. uh, it's a passion. You have to be passionate about this type of content. And eventually, money, numbers, fame will come with time. But there's a, a huge sense of responsibility too, because I bet um, many uh, young uh, females mm -hmm. are uh, following you, looking up to you as a role model. How do you take that sense of responsibility when you know that you, when you post something out there, it's going to have a huge impact on people? Believe me, if, if I say I don't think a lot about it, it's not a big concern for me because it's me. I don't have to put lots of effort to be like decent and to put the right uh, content because it's natural. I'm 37. I have years and years of experience. I know exactly what to say and how to say it. As a woman, the vision is clear for me. You keep saying, I'm a woman who knows what she wants. What, what, what do you want as a woman? Wow. What can you share with us? Yes. With time, you get to understand yourself more. And understanding myself is part of my story. I, um, I get to tell my story better when I understand myself. And I have lots of dreams and they keep on getting bigger and bigger with time and age. I consider myself lucky because I have a clear vision. Social media is very important for me now. And I'm starting a new project called Solist Mindfulness Hub. I told you about the importance of community for me. And building a, c a community is crucial for my career right now. Because I can feel the power of community. I can feel the power of bringing people together and looking at the same direction together. I'm happy with this discovery. So Solace will be the hub of my community for the future. And I'm planning to host book clubs and meetings. I have also the Storytelling Academy that I'll, I'm planning to launch in 2024. Uh, just to share my expertise in storytelling and how to use storytelling techniques on social media to create content on social media. My dreams really are getting bigger Doesn't with time. And I'm hoping that this upcoming year will be a great career shift for me. 
inshallah in 2024 you will um, realize your dreams i feel that you haven't told your story yet uh, behind everything that you've said you, what what is not coming through is your personal story and i feel that you haven't told it yet do you think one day will come where you will tell your own personal story to the world everything i post on social media is inspired by my own story and my own challenges and my own experiences but definitely i told you knowing your story is very important and you get to discover it with time especially when it comes to your childhood i was born in a tormented area and uh, under occupation I, i spent my whole childhood and my teenage years in war i was afraid of getting killed and injured my family as well so i have lots of insecurities and i was always searching for safety within myself and from the external world safety and security are very important for me now and yeah telling my story it's my plan and it's going to be in a book i want to write and i discovered the power of writing recently because i'm journaling every day and it's helping me a lot it's helping my creativity it's helping me to cope with my daily challenges uh, my daily life it's helping me also to to think clearly so journaling is very important for me right now and i keep on recommending to people but also writing is going to uh, take a huge part of my life uh, in the future hopefully so how did this uh, journey with uh, mental health start for you After my 30s actually I started to think about myself because I got married too early I was 22 when I got married and I had my kids and I was so busy raising them during my 20s but after my 30s I started a journey of self discovery and I started to ask myself those big questions who am I <laughs> why i behave like that why uh, yeah. uh i get nervous on certain things what i like and dislike well, i started to ask myself this que- these questions because i had time to st- to think about myself and uh, it was like an epiphany discovering my childhood traumas and going to therapy and accepting to go to therapy and i started reading those books about ptsd and we live in ongoing traumas in our region unfortunately and we don't get the chance to to heal from our traumas and i'm now in a better place but i still have a lot lots of work to do also i can share with you the story my father lost his eyesight when i was 3 years old and he was in the army and because of the war he lost his eyesight this event was very hard to understand it and to grasp it when i was a child and now i'm feeling at ease in telling my story <laughs> i wasn't really yeah. comfortable in saying the story of my family before because now i'm older and more mature and i understand what what happened to my dad influenced my personality of course and i had to overcome lots of insecurities because of it i encourage every woman or man to go to therapy do you know it's really amazing and for some women like us um, having children made us face our fears and insecurities because you knew that you're going to pass them on to your children if you don't fix them. I want to go back to what you said about your childhood. You yeah. lived under occupation and exactly. and, and how that, that relationship was very intimate because mm-hmm. it it hit your family very hard but your father's blindness because of the war. Is this conjured up now? Do you feel that the genocide that's happening in Gaza by the same occupier uh, yeah. is hitting you hard? Not actually. I'm too emotional. When I see children, when I see people under rubbles, I cannot understand it anymore. Even talking about it is hard. I understand the fear, of course. The fear of losing your life. When I remember those days, I remember that we used to stay days hiding in shelters but at the same time I used to detach from reality and my love for reading started from 
these days from these years of war and fear because I found refuge in books. I found my freedom. I could travel with my imagination, with characters from books and live a life that is better from what I'm living in, in reality. So this detachment helped me to cope with uh, the emotional and mental challenges that you live in a war zone. I love books for this reason, because they were my support uh, system. <laughs> they were my friends when I was young, when I was a child. Reading stories of people around the world, freeing. And I believed in myself and I believed that I can change my destiny because of these stories. Mm -hmm. So I encourage everyone living in war zone right now to try to detach at some point from reality and read books. You found your refuge in uh, reading. That's beautiful. And it's really painful. Are you a feminist? <laughs> <laughs> wow. <laughs> okay, we should define feminism. <laughs> 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 define feminism. Well, it varies because feminism varies from one culture to another, from one religion to another, from one human being to another, from one individual to another. And that's a very wide concept. Uh, but for me, let's, I'm going to talk about myself. It's to have the right and the freedom of choice. That's feminism for me. That's being free, being to choose whoever you want to be. You want to wear a veil. That's feminism for me. <laughs> you want to just uh, travel the world and uh, you don't want to marry, for example. You, you are free to be whoever you want to be. Really, feminism for me is a valuable concept, and I know many women fought their lives for the rights, and they paved the way for us to live freely. And when it comes to equality, I believe that we are equal when it comes to our rights and responsibilities without compromising our individuality. And I believe that we as women, we should preserve our, our womanhood. I can deduct certain themes for you. Mental health is one, right? Uh, yes. Writing and storytelling is another. What mm -hmm. else? Teaching. I'm enjoying teaching. <laughs> Recently, I started teaching and giving storytelling courses. Entrepreneurship. It's something new for me. I'm starting like in a few days, I'm going to start my uh, e-commerce. And I'm so excited for this new experience because I just want to challenge myself. I used to tell myself that I cannot be a businesswoman. I'm not good with money, but mm -hmm. I discovered that it's a question of mentality. I'm changing my mentality, my mindset. I'm shifting my mindset in 2024. I read lots of books and it's time to implement, it's time to, for execution. It's all about the mindset. You decide your destiny and you decide who you are. Three, inshallah, 2024 is going to be a very successful one. Keep on doing what you're doing. I love your content. Contribute to widening up our horizons. And I wish you really the best of luck. Oh, thank you so much. And I promise you, I'll be more brave in telling my story because, yeah, it requires courage. It's not easy. Thank you so much for this interview. It was a pleasure to talk to you and I wish you uh, a happy new year and a great year ahead. This is Women of the Middle East podcast. Thank you for listening and watching. To stay up to date with Women of the Middle East podcast, you can subscribe and don't forget to rate us. If you would like to contact me directly, you can do so on Instagram or via email.